it's really wonderful to be here. I'm going to speak quite quickly because I've got a lot to say and try and fit it into 15 minutes. Um, speaking this weekend has made me start thinking a lot about what activism is. And I think um, it's something I didn't come to until very recently. And uh, before that, I really thought that it meant big protests and marches and physical action. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people think and, and, and that they think it's not something that they can get involved in themselves and in a sort of less direct way. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently and I think for me, although obviously protests and marches are hugely powerful and important part of activism, for me activism is just changing somebody's mind and hopefully changing more than one person's mind and that's how I came to it because just over a year ago it's the first time I really realised I really wanted to change people's minds. Um, and what happened for me was that I started realising increasingly that I was having these experiences of sexism, whether it was someone screaming at me in the street, someone grabbing me in a club, someone commenting on my body, friends of mine who were having discrimination at work, that kind of thing. And when I started to talk about it, I was really surprised that people said, that's not a big deal anymore. Sexism is not not a thing. You must be overreacting. You need to learn to take a compliment or get a sense of humour. And I wanted to change people's minds. So I thought maybe the simplest way to start would be to look at why people thought that. And one of the things people kept saying to me was, women are equal now, so you can't make a fuss about this. So I looked at the statistics, and just very quickly to show you, these are the things that made me realise that I wanted to change people's minds. That people thought women were equal now, more or less. But in our parliament, where all of the decisions are made that affect every one of us, less than one in four MPs is a, is a woman. The UK comes joint 57th in the world for gender equality in parliament. And out of 193 world leaders, just 17 are women. Women are equal now, more or less. Except that in our courts of law, just four out of 38 Lord Justices of Appeal and 17 out of 110 High Court judges are women. Women are equal now, more or less. Except in our National Gallery, our most prestigious artistic institution, it was reported in 2010 that out of 2,300 works, the collection contains paintings by just 10 female artists. At the Royal Opera House, it's been over 13 years since a female choreographer was commissioned to create a ballet for the main stage, and out of 573 listed statues around the UK commemorating people of interest, just 15% of them are of women. Women are equal now, more or less. But fewer than one in 10 UK engineers is female, less than half the proportion of France or Spain. Our Royal Society has never had a female president and just 6% of the current fellowship are women. And while women make up 50% of chemistry undergraduates, only 6% reach the level of professor. Women are equal now, more or less. Except they write only one fifth of front page articles and 84% of those articles are dominated by a male expert or subject. Women directed just 5% of the 250 major films of 2012, down nearly by half from a paltry 9% in 1998. We only have 28% of speaking roles in those films, but one in three female characters is overtly sexualised. Just one in five UK architects is female, but 63% of them report experiencing sexual harassment during their career. Women are equal now, more or less. But in a UK Home Office survey as recently as 2009, one in five people said they thought it was acceptable for a man to hit or slap his wife or girlfriend in response to her being dressed in sexually revealing clothes in public. And 36% said that they thought a woman should be held fully or partially responsible if she's sexually assaulted or raped whilst drunk. There's a phone call to the police every minute about domestic violence. Every nine minutes a woman is raped, adding up to over 80,000 rapes and 400,000 sexual assaults every year. A woman in the UK has around a one in four chance of experiencing domestic violence and around a one in five chance of being the victim of a sexual offence. And around the world, one in three women on the planet will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. So suddenly that argument that we shouldn't make a fuss, we shouldn't be getting het up about this because women are equal now, more or less, just didn't stand up to me. But I realised that we had to change people's minds and that people weren't going to be able to tackle the issue of sexism if they couldn't even accept that it was a problem in the first place. So I started by setting up a very simple website where I asked women to join me in just saying what their experiences had been. And I hoped that if enough people could see those experiences all in one place together the way that I had, they might start to realise what a huge problem it really still was. And this is where I really started to understand the power of collective action. Because without leaving their homes, without having to go out, without making banners, women around the world joined this movement. 
And in just over a year, we've collected nearly 40,000 women's stories of what happened to them. They added them to the website, and they were truly added by women all over the world, women of all different races and ethnicities, sexual orientation, disabled and non-disabled women, religious and non-religious, employed and unemployed. A seven-year-old girl who was disabled in a wheelchair and a 74-year-old woman in a mobility scooter recorded almost identical experiences of shouted abuse about women drivers. A video game cashier told that every time she went up the ladder to get a new video from the storeroom, her manager would slap her on the bum, and when she came down, he'd lick down her top and say, you know why I hired you. A city worker was told that she had to sit on her boss's lap if she wanted her Christmas bonus. A midwife was sexually assaulted by a senior male colleague. A woman in Brazil was nearly dragged into a car by three men when she tried to ignore their catcalls. In Mexico, a young woman was told by her university professor, you look prettier when you shut up. In France, a man exposed himself to two girls aged 12 and 14 as they picnicked in a public park. And in Brazil, a woman was too scared to report the man with the erect penis pressed into her back on the train. And these voices combined really made the change that I'd wanted to make because suddenly all around the world, people started talking about this issue. It was picked up in the media, it was picked up in all of the major newspapers in the UK, it was picked up in magazines, it was picked up from the Times of India to French Glamour to Brazilian magazines to Canadian television. And suddenly everybody was talking about it and it really, really made me realise activism can just mean enough people who believe the same thing speaking up and raising their voices together. And I want to give you a really specific example of that because sometime later I started to get a lot of emails from women saying they were very upset about content they were coming across on Facebook. These were images and content which depicted and condoned domestic violence, violence against women and men, images of rape and sexual assault. And just to show you an example of what we're talking about, and please be aware that there is a trigger warning attached to these slides, they are very upsetting, so feel free to look away if you need to. And as you can see, there was different kinds of prejudice also mixed in there, some racism and homophobia as well. But mainly the big issue seemed to be that Facebook seemed to qualitatively consider these types of content to be different from other forms of prejudice. So they routinely took down images which promoted things like anti-Semitism and racism. But they thought that these kinds of images showing uh, harm to women, showing rape, and suggesting that that was something not only to laugh about but also to encourage, somehow didn't constitute a form of hate speech in the way that those other types of content did. So we launched a campaign just very simply to ask Facebook within its own framework, where it already moderated what content it considered acceptable and unacceptable, to acknowledge that these representations of graphic violence against women, graphic domestic violence and rape, ought to constitute a form of prejudice and hate speech if those other forms of content also did the same. Uh, and we sent some um, pictures to advertisers because Facebook wasn't listening, so we decided the best thing to do was to ask women around the world to take screen captures when this content appeared on their pages and to send it to the advertisers whose ads were appearing on the page alongside the content. So very publicly, you'd send a tweet to Sky, for example, saying, Facebook considers this content acceptable. Your advert sponsoring it. Do you think it's OK? Um, we also created infographics and images to try and make it very clear what our points were to anybody who was only seeing it fleetingly across social media, who might catch sight of it on somebody's Facebook page or on Twitter, to make it very clear exactly what the problem was, even if you only had a few seconds to be able to see what was going on. But absolutely, without doubt, the moment that the tide turned and the moment that we started winning was the moment when people around the world who cared about this not only started supporting us and 60,000 people tweeted using the hashtag FBRape, 5,000 people wrote to advertisers, wrote to Facebook, but they also started bringing their own creativity and their own imagination and their own ideas to the campaign. So some people just made simple photographs. Oh, sorry, hang on. Simple photographs, Dove was one of the advertisers that was particularly prolific on Facebook and when we contacted them they were extremely reticent to take any action, yet at the same time they were targeting women with these worldwide campaigns saying that women's 
um, wellness, well-being, the value of real women was what they really cared about. So people started to contact Dove and just very simply finding ways through photography, for example, to make their point, or through artistic brandalism. This was somebody who we didn't even know who set up a blog to support the campaign where every time an advertiser said that they weren't going to do anything, the person would take their logo or some, some of their advertising images and, and incorporate within that something from the campaign. To ingenious artwork, this was one of the most famous images that Facebook refused to take down during the campaign, saying that at the time it did not violate their policies. So a photographer made this composite image of that picture of that little girl's face out of the avatars of every one of Dove's Twitter followers and then sent it back to them saying, Dove, these are your customers. And then people found other brilliant ways of making sure that their message was getting through in every kind of possible medium. So some people found out that at the time, Dove was running this sort of quite saccharine, unstoppable girl campaign, where they were asking people to nominate their unstoppable girl in their life. And people started flooding their page with submissions about the three of us, myself, Sarah Shmali, and Jacqueline Friedman, who had coordinated the Facebook rape campaign. So in every way, and in really inventive ways, that didn't cost anything, that didn't mean that they had to take a huge amount of time, people around the world came together and really, really made this happen. And just one week after we launched the campaign, Facebook made a really unprecedented landmark public statement saying that they would change their policies on gendered violence and what constituted hate speech, and that they would do everything that we'd asked them to do in our open letter, that they would work with us not only to change those policies, but also to retrain their moderators to recognise images that constituted rape and domestic violence, and to recognise the implications that the real-world pandemic of violence against women has on women's experiences on and offline. And I really think that this is a kind of tipping point because Facebook as a company, of course it was only one thing, of course it's only one part of the internet, but it has a huge influence on normative ideas about what is and isn't acceptable. And there are other forms of prejudice that used to be socially acceptable that have become taboo within society and I really hope and think that this represents the beginning of a tipping point in our international attitudes towards violence against women and towards misogyny. It's something that's being talked about more and more and more. And I think beyond anything, this campaign really showed that all it takes is for enough people who care, men and women, because it's so important that we stand with men and do this with them, and some of our biggest supporters are men, around the world can stand up and raise their voices. And it doesn't have to always mean traveling somewhere or going on a march or necessarily doing any of those things that you associate with activism. But together, raising enough people's voices really can make a difference.